quickly because it, it is the committee's policy that all witnesses are sworn in. Would you all raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give before this sub subcommittee will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. This is, uh, this is the final panel. It's an important panel. It comes from the community, from those who've been most affected, most affected and most involved. The president uh, of American University, Cornelius Kerwin, first alumnus, alumnus to serve, uh, works, uh, focuses on public policy, Chairman Greg uh, Bumel, community co-chair of the Residential Advisory Board, um, became co-chair in 2005, served since 2002. Um, Nan Wells, Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner, represents uh, the, a community of 2,000 residents living in Spring Valley. Thomas Smith, a 30-year 30 30 resident of Spring Valley. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, he represents uh, the uh, Spring Valley, uh, to represent the uh, Spring Valley American University and Westover Place neighborhoods, um, and Kent Slowinski, founding member of the Environmental Health Group, which of course uh, investigates environmental health problems. And finally, James Barton, president of Underwater Ordnance Recovery. Uh, and so I'm going to ask us as, to proceed forthwith with President Kerwin first. Thank you, Congresswoman Norton. I'll, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Neil Kerwin. I've been president of American University for four years, serving as interim president from August 2005 to July 2007, and president from July 2007 till now. I've been a member of the American University community for nearly 40 years. And we appreciate this committee's ongoing interest in this project, uh, knowing as we do that it is motivated by a concern for the safety and well-being of everyone in Northwest Washington. American University participated in hearings on the Corps of Engineers project that were held in July of 2001 by the House Subcom Subcommittee on the District of Columbia. At that time, we provided a substantial number of historical documents and communications dating from 1917 through 2001 on the use of our campus by the United States government and the United States Army. The compendium is a valuable resource of project background and information provided by American University, which was one of 10 properties in Spring Valley used by the United States government in an effort to support the nation during wartime. Uh, fundamental to our action and our position on these matters are a few overarching truths. American University did not produce, test, or bury, conceal chemical munitions. The war material produced, tested, and buried around Spring Valley uh, and American University are the responsibility of the United States government, the U.S. Army, the Corps of Engineers, and now the partners with which it works. American University has made available all information to the Army Corps of Engineers regarding the cleanup, and the university has endured years of dislocation, suspended operations, business interruption, unreimbursed cost in the millions of dollars, and periodic safety concern as the Army Corps has conducted its multi-year effort to find and remove items from that era. It has been our consistent position to act with an abundance of caution to ensure the safety of all. Senior members of the university have been assigned to work with the Army Corps and to monitor their activity. We've hired outside expertise to independently assess the Army Corps' work to fully protect our campus and to ensure the safety of the surrounding area. 
To assess risk, we hired Dr. Paul Krastowski almost 10 years ago as an advisor to the university to review the recommendations and the work performed by the Corps and their contractors. He's an environmental engineer, an applied toxicologist and chemist whose expertise has benefited the university and the surrounding community on major ra matters ranging from the establishment of a stringent arsenic cleanup standard to recommending additional safety measures on the core containment structure on Glenbrook Road. AU's ongoing information sharing efforts have expanded over the past 20 years and have included campus memoranda, open meetings, news articles, materials posted electronically, and historical documents in the university archives. A university website devoted to the Army Corps activity has been an information resource with links and we believe helpful information. That site now includes more than 80 communications that have been posted with project updates since the year 2000. As risks have warranted, we have targeted specific populations with pertinent information and taken additional measures over the past 10 years, such as hosting fora, meetings and discussions, instructing our staff, our faculty and students how to shelter in place, suspending operations on high-use athletic fields for two years, closing our child development center, which serves as a daycare center, an educational facility for our faculty and staff students, uh, children, closing that for nine years, testing defined campus populations for arsenic poisoning. These are only a few examples. Every outreach has, that we've done has been based on the nature of a particular situation and the potential risk at hand. A high probability occurrence might require a rapid response with specific safety protocols, while a low probability occurrence might prompt a general sharing of information. AU's archives are open and accessible to anyone and have been used extensively by journalists, government agencies, and community members to learn more about the history of these activities in Northwest Washington. The only archived documents not publicly available are Board of Trustee materials that deal with the American University as a private corporation and include confidential information related to governance, personnel matters, third party, and financial information. To respond to questions whether these private records might contain pertinent information, in April of 2005, AU Council made these records available to independent parties from the Environmental Protection Agency. They reviewed trustee minutes and information from that period and agreed there was no information included that might help the Corps locate additional burial sites or to assist in the cleanup and remediation. This was reported to the Restoration Advisory Board, or RAB, in May of 2005 and at a partnering meeting. We want to thank you for your help, Congresswoman Norton, over the years to help ensure the affected areas in Northwest Washington are completely cleaned and that all of World War I debris and byproducts are fully and safely restored. We will, we have, and we continue to do all we can to assist in that effort. Thank you very much, Mr. Kerwin. Uh, we're going to go to Ms. Wells, but would everybody shift a little bit to the left? The expert witness just arrived. So we got a little crowded table there. Uh, and we'll, oh yeah, right here, my left, you're right. Um, Ms. Wells? Uh, thank you so much, Congresswoman Norton. I just want to thank you again for organizing the hearing today. Your leadership on behalf of the Spring Valley residents has been crucial in presenting uh, our concerns and making certain that the cleanup is thorough and complete before the Army Corps of Engineer leaves, Engineers leaves the area again. My comments today will be brief as the ANC Commissioner for a large part of Spring Valley extending to Dale Carlia Parkway. And I have joined with my fellow Commissioner Tom Smith in working with the local and federal officials responsible for the ongoing effort to remove World War I munitions, chemical weapons, and other contamination from the community in which we live. The uh, project schedule, which was attached to my testimony uh, and which we've discussed, um, 
indicates that the Army plans to finish in fiscal year 210, which ends September 30th, 2010, and that's only about 16 months from now. So we have less than two years. In 2011, the Army would complete reports on the status of the cleanup and the level of remaining contamination. Um, however, um, it is not clear that uh, they will continue any of the more active investigations. Furthermore, ongoing project activities and remediation have been limited by insufficient funding. I realize there's been testimony to the contrary here, but I base that on my participation in the partnering meetings where I know that things have been set aside or things have been put to a lower priority, even though, in my view, they should be followed up. There is considerable concern that uh, the Army will end the active investigations before the final reports that contain the required information on the cleanup are completed and reviewed by independent experts. And I want to say how important, and I totally agree with you, <clears throat> that we have independent experts verify the accuracy and thor thoroughness of the effort. In order to successfully complete this project, we need the following. I would recommend an independent and expert review of the project's methods and data by the National Academy of Sciences. Number two, additional funding sufficient to complete these necessary investigations and the reme remediation activities. I might add that American University was able to get an earmark to complete some of the work on their area. I think it was in FY08. Um, and then number three, disclosure of all environmental data to the public. Um, I will note later on that, um, that we, while we can participate now in the partnering meetings, we're now able to speak to our fellow commissioners and to other public officials. We cannot release any information from the partnering meetings to the public until it's been specifically sort of declassified. Number four, increased, and this follows along with this, increased transparency, accountability, and oversight from all of the participating agencies and involved institutions, including the D.C. Department of the Environment, the EPA, the Army Corps, and American University. We need to work together on these, uh, on these issues. The Army began the cleanup, as everyone has stated, 16 years ago. Uh, but there was no organized exploration of the extent of the contamination until the accidental discovery of, uh, of uh, the uh, munitions and chemical fill weapons uh, in the Spring Valley West section. There is, however, evidence that various institutions and the Army Corps knew at least as early as 1986 that there were possible burial sites. The AUES site and operations were extensive, I, uh, some of the written sources I've seen say that Camp Leach involved as many as 100,000 soldiers and 1,200 chemists and engineers. It has also been described as the world's second largest poison gas facility in 1917 and 1918. Um, as been stated before, the Army Corps uh, said that declared Spring Valley safe and, and uh, left. Again, in 1995, they declared it safe but the D D.C. Department of Health and the dedicated professionals in that department um, contested that decision and following that, two large uh, or large toxic sites on Glenbrook Road were located in 1998. Um, however, the Army withdrew from a part of that site in 2002 <coughs> after four years when the contractor who owned the property withdrew permission for access to his property and left the site unfinished. And I might note that this has been an issue on a variety of properties and looking for various uh, uh, bunkers and other sources. They have not used their walk-in authority and uh, we have a recent case in which they wanted to place a groundwater well, well a deep well. And it, they went through five years of negotiations with the property owners until EPA threatened to, uh, to march in, and the uh, family finally agreed to allow some monitoring to go on. So I would argue that this has delayed the project because they have been unwilling to use the authority they have. Um, there's also concern about the Army's plans to destroy chemical munitions in the neighborhood in, I understand, just now, August of this year. 
Although the Army has destroyed munitions using the same technology before, it is my understanding, and I'm pretty certain about this, this will be the first time the process will be used to destroy explosively configured munitions that could release arsine gas. It's a highly toxic chem chemical for which there is no antidote. The Army currently plans to destroy the munitions and neutralize the chemicals left behind in, a, in an area just behind Sibley Hospital, near the Grand Oaks Retirement Residence, near the DC Reservoir, and next to a Spring Valley residential neighborhood. We have urged that the destruction be undertaken at a federal facility, of which there are many in DC and the surrounding area. Uh, similar destruction, I believe, in the past has only been done on military bases and was done once in a very lightly populated area of Arkansas. But we have, they have never destroyed munitions explosively configured containing arsine gas. Now they do have and have set up uh, special conditions to contain the release of gas. But nonetheless, you have a hospital, a retirement home, and a residential neighborhood. Um, we, uh, on the one hand, I might point out some of the inconsistencies that we face as ANC commissioners. On the one hand, we are told that the storage and destruction of these materials, explosively configured or icing, are so safe that the process can take place in this location. However, we are told that the materials are so dangerous that we cannot know exactly what they are. This inconsistency doesn't inspire confidence. In 2007, when I asked for a report on the results, of the prior investigations carried out on Glenbrook Road from 1999 to 2002, I was told that that report had never been completed and therefore could not be released and I could not see it. It is still not available. And that investigation ended in 2002. Groundwater monitoring is critically important, both in determining, determining levels of contamination and locating potential sites of contamination as the Congresswoman has stated. This, the project has installed a large number of groundwater monitoring wells around the reservoir and the uh, university. However, groundwater in these wells has not been tested since 2007, almost two and a half years ago. There are plans to test the wells in 2009, but it is June and to date no testing has been done. Additional groundwater wells are scheduled to be installed this year in order to determine the, uh, further determine the flow of groundwater near the reservoir. However, still no regular schedule for testing groundwater has been proposed. Uh, my experience, contrary to some of the testimony of the GAO uh, representative, uh, is that too much of the information on the contamination discovered thus far has been restricted, often for reasons that don't make sense. National security is frequently cited as the reason data and other information cannot be shared, that we cannot share it with others, and that indeed much of it can't be shared with us. We are told that the information would be useful to terrorists. Um, I am well aware of national security concerns. I held an arms, uh, I mean a top secret clearance, or a secret clearance, while I work for the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute. I understand security needs, but I have never seen the kind of, I would say, well, I'll leave it with the kind of security excuses, if you will, that we've been receiving for the information we need. Um, I, when I first began attending the, partner, the meetings of the partnering group, which you've heard much about, the agencies and whatnot, and that was only because I, when I became ele uh, an elected ANC official, um, only uh, elected, uh, I mean, uh, local officials and or members of the agencies or members of the RAB are able to attend the partnering meeting. I was not allowed to discuss any of the information at first when I first did this that I learned with my fellow ANC commissioners, including Tom Smith, other public officials or members of the public. Even agency representatives were not allowed to share the information they were given at the meetings with their supervisors. Sometimes it appears that the partnership serves to restrict and challenge uh, Army and, uh, and restrict challenges to Army plans and delay progress of the, uh, of, uh, of the uh, plans. 
In addition to concerns about health and safety, the location of a major DC reservoir near the area of contamination leads to questions about the possible impact on residents in other areas of the city. In testimony presented on April 12, 2006, to the DC Committee on Public Works and Environment, Colonel Robert J. Davis, Commander Baltimore District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, described why the testing of groundwater, especially for contaminants like perchlorate, is so important. Colonel Davis stated the following at the hearing. As suggested at the Spring Valley RAB meeting last night, our groundwater elevation data does suggest that some limited groundwater is likely seeping into the reservoir at specific locations. However, we expect this volume of groundwater to be minute compared to Potomac River water entering the reservoir every day. And we have had no significant detections in groundwater wells closest to the reservoir. Our phase two investigation later this year and next will provide much more information as to whether any Spring Valley <coughs> groundwater contamination detected upgrading of the reservoir could pose a future risk. While Tom Smith and I now have the ability to discuss information with public officials and they can discuss information with others in the agencies, agency and public access to information remains limited. The DC Department of the Environment is not allowed to know the chemicals that will be brought into DC for use in the destruction of the munitions this summer, nor have they been given the identity of the chemicals in the hazardous waste that will be produced. Our concerns in Spring Valley are not that different from many FUDS communities. Having spent most of my professional life working with scientists and with universities in support of science, I am not here to criticize or complain. It is crucial that all the parties and agencies work together to complete the successful remediation of this site, which my neighbors and I call home. We must make certain that public health and safety are protected and the data verifying the cleanup is released to the public. Thank you very much for this opportunity to appear before the committee. Thank you very much, Ms. Wells. I want to alert uh, this panel that in uh, 20 minutes to a half hour, even the voteless delegate from the District of Columbia can, gets to vote because there's a vote in the Committee of the Whole. And I wrote a memo that has resulted in my being able to vote there. So I'd like to get this hearing completed before them. I'm going to ask everyone to briefly summarize uh, the testimony so I can make sure we get to everybody before I have to leave myself. Uh, Mrs. Smith, very glad to hear from you now. Uh, good, good afternoon. My name is Thomas Smith. I've lived in Spring Valley for nearly 30 years, as you mentioned. For the last three, I've served as an ANC commissioner representing Spring Valley and part of the American University campus. Few, if any, residents knew that the AU campus was used as the second largest chemical weapons research and testing facility in the world during World War I until munitions were discovered in 1993 during new home construction. Only then did residents learn that weapons had been found previously during construction on the AU campus and that the Army was aware of the potential dangers that existed in our neighborhood. Whatever their reasons, both American University and the Army kept this information concealed. This pattern of non-disclosure by both institutions continues today. The decision by the Corps to leave the community prematurely in 95, along with the way the Corps has interacted with the community since returning to the neighborhood, including the operations of the Army-created RAB, has cast a long shadow of doubt on the credibility of the Corps. These concerns are heightened when reviewing the experiences of so many other communities across the country dealing with similar problems. The Corps has not yet finished assessing various areas of interest in the community or dealing with the serious groundwater problem. Decisions are being made about whether certain areas of interest thought to be possible sites of contamination, burial, or anomalies are worth additional investigation. The new 210 deadline is an, is an incentive to neglect, as before, the type of investigation that is needed to ensure our community is safe. The team charged with the responsibility of searching for and identifying potential areas of interest, the Area of Interest Task Force, referred earlier by Colonel Muller, has been disbanded, according to the Army, because one of the members has retired. Much information about this project is hidden from the public on the basis of national security, enabling the Corps to escape the public scrutiny and accountability that should be a routine part of this cleanup process. Too often we are forced to play the role of amateur sleuth and be laser precise in our language, even to learn the most basic of information about this cleanup. There are too many unanswered questions to limit the investigation at this time. We have the high levels of perchlorate in the groundwater. The groundwater has not been monitored for two years, unlike in some other states dealing with the military's pollution of the groundwater. 
Nearly the, the nearly 30 jugs of mustard gas near a burial site or in the archival photos said to be a, burial, a deep burial site have never been found. There are questions about whether an upcoming investigation at the Della Carlia Woods will cover a large enough area. Additional questions are being raised about the limits of the equipment used to conduct the geophysical investigations of key sites in the community and whether more sophisticated but expensive technology might provide information of what is underground at deeper levels. There is historical evidence of another burial pit near the campus known as the Courier or Osborne Pit, thought to contain the nearly 800,000's worth of chemical weapons in 1918 dollars, and there is no indication that an aggressive effort is in place to locate this pit. Residents have long sought testing of the air in their homes, especially given the high concentration of arsenic in the soil and the presence of arsine gas and munitions. The Corps has said that such testing was not technologically feasible. Yet the Army conducted such air testing in, contain in containment structures when investigating a recent burial pit. The state of Wisconsin has mandated indoor air testing for homes near groundwater that is contaminated with perchlorate because of threats to the health of homeowners. But there are no plans to conduct indoor air testing at homes in Spring Valley where the groundwater runs at basement level. Although our surface soil has been tested for arsenic, why is the Corps not testing for manganese and mercury, which also have been found in high concentrations in our neighborhood? Recently, there was a new find of mercury at the AU Public, Public Safety Building. I welcome the comments today of Mr. Hawkins, especially since DDOE acknowledged at a public roundtable convened by the D.C. Council just last month that it was playing a, quote, passive role in the cleanup. Recently, some residents indicated an interest in using land once owned by AU for a playground. This area was thought at one time to include a bunker that has not been quote unquote pinpointed according to the Corps. There is no additional investigation of this site planned even though in recent years part of this land also has been slated for future development. Can the Corps assure us that this land is safe for children and that new home construction will not unearth the kind of munitions that were found 16 years ago? Our questions to the Corps and AU about this site have so far gone unanswered. Are there risks that we must learn to live with in our community? Absolutely. But these should be informed decisions, not circumstances forced upon us. Two weeks ago, I learned from a friend of mine that a college buddy of hers had died recently of a brain tumor in his mid-50s. He was one of three who had died of cancer in recent years at roughly the same age. All three lived at a fraternity on campus that now houses the AU Child Development Center. There was an obituary in the Washington Post just this week of a former resident of Spring Valley who had been diagnosed with a brain tumor but died at 50 from complications of pulmonary fibrosis, a disease thought rare for that age. We hear almost routinely of residents or former residents with new diagnoses of peripheral neuropathies, a common manifestation of arsenic poisoning. There are many more health-related stories that could be told, but a comprehensive health care study has never been conducted within our community. So there's a lot at stake for us. Cleaning up the community is not just a matter of safeguarding the environment in which we live, it's also about protecting the health and well-being of multiple generations of residents. When weapons were found in our community by accident in 1993, they were helicoptered out and sent elsewhere to be stored and destroyed. Today those weapons are stored and destroyed in our community, the only residential community where toxic chemical weapons are destroyed, in this case, less than 1,000 feet from a hospital. At least that's the information that we were provided by the Army Corps at a community meeting last March. Mm -hmm. We know that the AUES was Ms. the Los Ms. Alamos. Ms. Mrs. Smith, uh, we're going to run out of time. I have one more sentence. All right. Okay. I promise <laughs> you one more sentence. You know, each of our residents in Spring Valley and throughout the city has a right to know that military pollution left over from this chemical research conducted in D.C. poses no danger to current or future residents. That's our responsibility to the people who elected us and is one that I and others here today are more than ready to share with this subcommittee and any other elected or appointed official in D.C. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Mrs. Lewinsky. My name is Kent Slowinski. I grew up in Spring Valley in the 1950s and 60s, and since the 1970s, I've worked in Spring Valley as a landscape crew member, contractor, and architect. I'm also a former RAB member. As the Army Corps likes to say, bottom line up front, the current process is just not working. Over the past 16 years, we've had to endure flawed sampling, secret sampling, sampling that never took place, and incomplete historical research 
attempts to rewrite history. Several uninvestigated burial pits, no cumulative health risk assessments, a dysfunctional RAB, and more recently, a one-year backlog in posting meet partnering meeting minutes to the Spring Valley website. If the Army Corps can't even post minutes in a timely manner, can we trust them with destroying chemical munitions less than 1,000 feet from the district's water supply? Davis Robinson, one of the original RAB members, said, if the Army Corps was a private contractor, they would have been fired a long time ago. The Spring Valley issue became personal for me in 1995, when my mason found a Stokes mortar while working on a house on Sedgwick Street. The current owners are dealing with serious health problems, and one of the previous owners developed a brain tumor. On the same block were two cases of aplastic anemia, in the same house, 20 years apart, both fatal. One was a seven-year-old girl, the other was a 70-year-old man. Aplastic anemia is very rare. Just one case raises red flags. On three adjacent properties were three cases of multiple myeloma. Again, each one fatal. On another adjacent property was one case of pernicious anemia. That individual, Camille Som, survived. She and her sister, Beth Junium, collected anecdotal health information from their neighbors. This was the beginning of the Northwest Current's Spring Valley Disease Survey. You don't have to be a Harvard-trained epidemiologist to know that something is terribly wrong here. We've been living with this toxic brew of more than 600 AUS chemicals for 90 years now. To date, we know of more than 200 residents, students, and workers with health problems associated with chemical exposure. My name, as well as several friends and family members, is on that list. The 2007 Johns Hopkins scoping study, not a health study, found that residents' anecdotal health problems were consistent with the existing scientific literature on exposure to chemical warfare agents and agent breakdown products. Unfortunately, the follow-up health study has been delayed and is only partially funded. We need another $500,000 to fully fund the study. And we need to include some of the early and long-time Spring Valley residents in that study. Little is being done to educate people about the symptoms of exposure or to assist residents, students, and workers who may have been exposed. We will likely need additional funding for medical monitoring and for independent sampling of soil, air, and water to determine if the Army Corps' cleanup is truly complete. I don't know how you can conduct a thorough cleanup when the historical research is incomplete and a conceptual site model for Spring Valley has never been developed. These are the first two steps of any cleanup, and it makes you wonder if the Army Corps really wants to be here and do the work. It's clear that the current process is not working, but what do we do? One solution is to put the Spring Valley on the Superfund National Priorities List and have EPA take the lead along with a more proactive DC Department of Environment. Another possibility is to ask the National Academy of Sciences to do a study on the thoroughness of the cleanup. Looking at the bigger picture, at current Pentagon funding levels of just $250 million annually, it will take 80 to 160 years to clean up the known contamination at three to 5,000 formerly used defense sites. If annual FUDS funding was increased to $2 billion, these sites could be cleaned up in a much more reasonable 10 to 20 years. To conclude, one, we need more transparency and oversight. Two, we need to do a better job researching, investigation, or investigating, and cleaning up Spring Valley. Three, we need to do a better job protecting the health and safety of the citizens of the District of Columbia. And four, we need your help. It's time for a change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slowinski. Mr. Bumail. Congresswoman Norman, Norton, excuse me, please, and members of the committee, I want to thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. I'm Greg Boimel, the community co-chair of the Spring Valley Restoration Advisory Board, or RAB. I began serving on the RAB in June 2002 and became co-chair in 2005. I've also served on the science task group of the RAB and as chair of that group. I'm joined today by Dr. Peter DeFore, the science advisor of the RAB. 
Uh, to answer some previous questions, the Restoration Advisory Board was established by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers under DOD regulations to obtain community input into the Environmental Restoration Program at Spring Valley. Members come from two categories, uh, residential and institutional. Residential members are volunteers who must live or work within the boundary of the FUDs. Institutional members represent the major institutions in Spring Valley and include AU, the Horace Mann Elementary School, uh, the DC Department of the Environment, US EPA, and the Army Corps of Engineers. When voting to provide advice to the Army, only residential members are counted. Briefly, I'm a toxicologist with 20 years experience in human health risk assessment, quantitative and qualitative analysis of chemical data, regulatory support, database management, communications, program and project management. I performed more than 50 risk assessments at federal facilities nationwide, ranging from baseline risk assessments to toxicity assessments. The statement is my own evaluation and comment on the cleanup at Spring Valley. It is based on a meeting with the science task group of the RAB, consisting of Dr. Peter DeFure, a, de a geologist on the staff of the National Research Council, excuse us, Dr. David Fury, and Dr. Peter DeFure, the technical advisor to the RAB. Uh, who is a research associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University and a full-time uh, private consultant. Uh, mo most of this test much of this testimony was presented by Dr. DeFeuer at a meeting called by Councilmember Mary Che of the District of Columbia, Columbia City Council. Jumping ahead to save time, um, an upcoming project concern is the plan to destroy military munitions recovered during the investigations that are now ending. The plan to destroy the munitions in a specially designed and constructed mobile facility located on the federal property makes sense and presents the lowest risk situation, in my professional opinion, and that of the members of the RAB Science Task Group. Our conclusion is based on risk factors identified for destruction activities, the design and operation of the destruction equipment, and the characteristics of the known threats to human health. Two of the greatest risk factors are the handling and transport of such items. Each handling increases the probability that a mistake can result in an accident. Transportation not only requires special permits from any state uh, through which the items must move, but increases the probability for accidents and unexpected events. In terms of special actions and risks on site, the risks are lowered by the fact of two containment systems, air handling systems, well-tested equipment, experienced operators, distance from the facility to any residents or commercial facilities, and a plan to monitor local weather and proceed only when safe conditions prevail. Given all the specific risk factors, I agree with the decision to proceed with on-site destruction using this equipment. In 1993, the Army dramatically flew Spring Valley munitions out of the neighborhood via helicopter. Those days have ended as communities realized that they did not want to become a secondary dumping ground for highly dangerous materials recovered in, in another community. In 1999, the Army completed fabrication of a usable prototype of the mobile explosive destruction system that is used, that is allowed for the destruction of chemical munitions closer to the location of discovery. Since then, the EDS has been used at a number of communities throughout the U.S., including Spring Valley, with great success. You look for independent oversight. I don't claim to have independent oversight, but we do have a technical advisor who works for the RAB and has been uh, represented in most of the technical discussions and deliberations. Uh, and uh, they have taken his input and contributions on par with other agency input. According to Army, Army policy, this TAP grant is supposed to last for five years with a $25,000 limit on each year. On two occasions, I have requested that the Baltimore District Commander of the, United, of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers ask the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army to waive caps on the TAP grants for Spring Valley, and in both cases, my request has been granted, and we continue to receive funding and continue to have this outside technical expertise available to the community. Uh, he attends the monthly technical partnering meeting when available. Uh, he also attends calls and meetings on groundwater, soil sampling, uh, determining the list of chemicals to sample, special site investigations, etc. He was part of the group that investigated other areas that may have been overlooked, the Area of Interest Task Force, and helped arrange a site visit by Rick Woods, who had discovered munitions more than 10 years ago. I'm going to jump to the end because I know you're out of time. 
Um, the purpose of these investigations is to find other World War I area item, era items if they exist. So I'll be surprised if additional discoveries are not made. The current schedule leaves time for additional discoveries of the size made this past May of World War I 75 millimeter munition items and pieces of grenades. If there is a major discovery such as a new burial pit, the schedule will need adjustment. At this point, we will need to see the resolve of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to complete the project. Thank you. Mr. Barton, uh, let's, let's take as much of your testimony as we can. I, I don't, <laughs> um, that's the bell. I, the 15, that's the 15 minute bell. It usually lasts more than 15 minutes, but uh, I, I'd like you to summarize your testimony, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we haven't found everything that's in Spring Valley, and we're not going to the way we're doing it. Uh, a new methodology is called for, one that's not being used anywhere else in the country, that uses the latest science and technology, brilliant minds, to uh, detect the presence of and map trace amounts of uh, these toxins. And um, we need third-party oversight. We need somebody who's not uh, currently at the table, I think. Uh, but we definitely need a new approach to doing it. And there are new and emerging technologies that would, are non-invasive and allow us to take atmospheric and, and surface water and, and runoff water, groundwater samplings quicker, faster, smarter, and more effective, which can direct our remedial efforts in the right direction. So that nothing, if, if, if your house, for instance, has got gas coming in it, we'll do what we can do, for instance, then, because we know where it's coming from. If we can't eliminate it, perhaps that house has to go. But at least we now have a focused look uh, using the latest technology. And we're not doing it. We're using standard protocols as you would anywhere else in the country. And there's nothing uh, normal about this particular site. This is the birth of our chemical weapons uh, uh, program for this country. And it's a residential. It's unrestricted residential use. Oh, my God. You know, we, we, they were mixing and matching everything here. And you can find it everywhere. And we haven't found it everywhere. We haven't begun to find lots of this stuff. But what's most important is finding what's coming into your homes, finding what's killing us, why there's people in the ground, why there's professionals who are not in their offices anymore, but they don't have a job anymore because they rub somebody the wrong way. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do better than what we're doing right now. And I'd like to help do that if I could. Uh, incidentally, and forgive me for not introducing myself, my name is James Barton. I'm the president of Underwater Ordnance Recovery. Uh, I'm a subject matter expert on munitions. I've been diving on piles of bombs for 34 years. And because of the nature of my business, I'm quite familiar with these, uh, the science is the answer. Uh, the new technologies and the science to detect and trace, uh, track trace amounts of, tech, of, uh, of toxins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me say the purpose of this testimony was not to, uh, forgive me, cross-examine the, the community, as it were, because you are not the responsible parties. Of course, the RAB uh, members have some responsibility, but again, they're not uh, public officials. The point was to hear from, uh, from people within the community, uh, essentially a critique uh, of what has been done. Now, that has to be weighed alongside what the, the Army, the Army Corps, the EPA, and the officials said. And I want to express my appreciation for the Corps and, and the Army for remaining to hear you out. I had wanted to hear the community first because, in fairness, I thought the Army should be able to, for example, respond to some of, of what we heard. And I think they would have felt better about responding since the whole point here is solve a problem and, and to, uh, to, to, to be truly uh, transparent. But I appreciate that you saved, you, 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 uh, you, you regarded the uh, testimony of the community important enough so that late as it is, you have, have, um, have stayed uh, to hear it. Uh, I, I must say, you know, when, when we hear a testimony, for example, and he had to give it this way, uh, this is Mr. Bumel's testimony. Testimony, you know, as I have some boilerplate in here, I've signed the confidentiality, uh, the confidentiality agreement. One of one of the rest of you said that too. It's speaking to a member of Congress, speaking to a committee of Congress, I have signed a confidentiality agreement about some munitions 100 years old, and so I can't tell you what the weapons are, and I can't tell 
the community what the weapons are. That is a problem. This community is going to know what those weapons were when this is all over. And I use the word were advisedly because they are were. Uh, I think what we have already uh, found out in the 16 years you've been there is most of what was there uh, has, has withered away in some way or the other. Uh, the health study notions are important. This is very controversial because after health studies, nobody is ever able to say when it comes to cancer that this was the cause. You are able to see certain kinds of trends and to make certain kinds of conclusions. And then I'm not sure what you do about them. Uh, but the, the remaining problems in, in this period, and, and as far as we're concerned, the Army's self-declaration that it is leaving is null and void. Nobody leaves until the Congress of the United States says, yes, we think it is time to go. Uh, and we will have to see what these two years bring us, and much will be, depend on the transparency of the effort. And we begin with transparency of what in the world we're talking about and what have we been talking about for 16 years. And we don't even know that. It makes many in the community, it certainly makes this member of Congress feel that we're ground zero uh, because we don't even know what we've been digging about all this time. It's an absurdity, of course, but it's a bureaucratic absurdity that's been put upon everybody, including the public officials who are here because it's obviously above their pay grade. We're gonna find out whose pay grade it is. Because it, it would be impossible for this subcommittee and this full committee to authorize the end of this effort without knowing what we were ending and without the community not knowing what we were ending. Um, the testimony has been uh, very important. We've been, <laughs> uh, uh, we've been uh, taking notes and then we remembered we'll ha we have it in writing in, in any case so that uh, these questions can be presented uh, to uh, the first witnesses who have been kind enough to stay so that they can have the opportunity to respond to them. Uh, and and the, the subcommittee uh, uh, remains most interested in how we're, going, how we're going to reach agreement that the time has come to go. And we are fully aware that we're dealing with ongoing issues and that they may come again. Mr. Bimel, I think, I think uh, your point was well taken. Uh, when we're talking about things that are hidden so, so deeply that we don't even know where they are, uh, we can't say that nothing will ever happen again. And that's why the, the, the nature of the monitoring, the nature of the testing, and frankly, what looks like testing and monitoring that's going to have to be permanent. As long as you tell me that there are, place, there are places that you'll never get to uh, because they're buried so deep, de deeply and you don't even know where they are, I don't know that in that sense uh, this site will ever be vacated as far as the government uh, uh, is concerned. Um, I want to thank all of the witnesses, particularly for this testimony, which has been invaluable uh, to uh, this committee. And of course, as I indicated, this is the beginning uh, we don't mean to subject everybody to a continuous round of hearings, but we've got to then answer the questions that you have very appropriately raised and have been raised throughout this hearing. I thank you very much for this testimony. And the hearing is adjourned.